Good morning, everybody. Uh, here we are at the uh, ICT Educator Webinar Series, uh, something we do every Friday about 10 o'clock. And the purpose is to bring you conference quality uh, presentations in the area of ICT and, uh, for the community, focused primarily on community college educators. So you don't really have to spend all that money going to conferences, you know, and have to waste money at the bar, or this, that, or the other. We want you to have an enjoyable time at your desk with a cup of coffee. And on, then, of course, all these things are archived on our website, the videos, which are then chapterized, and the pre PowerPoint presentations are supplied, and the entire transcript is, is in a Word document, so you can go back and get that. Any other links or materials uh, provided by the presenters are, are there as well. So you have a complete set of information relevant to this. And sometimes it helps us build a body of knowledge in an area. And I think today's a good uh, case for that. Next slide, please, uh, Nicole. Uh, but coming up first, uh, next week, we're gonna be covering uh, certification exams and how your campuses participate with the various uh, testing centers they have now. And, and what an outside consultant might recommend that we do differently. And that was a wonderful study done recently and completed uh, by an industry expert. And then we're going to be looking at how uh, business engagement informs the IT guided pathways, which is kind of a, a modern way of saying, let's look at the IT model curriculum and, and the IT technician pathway and, and understand their, their relevance to uh, certifications, to transfer, and a lot of other capabilities that are really important to our students. And then we'll be looking at the uh, Haiku Cyber Range for Cybersecurity Training, which is relevant to this one as well. Next slide. Um, wow, we have a lot of presenters today. <laughs> and uh, we are going to, this is one of our more challenging presentations. We do have so many people and we're really testing the limits of Zoom and our ability to upload this and download that. But the idea is to give you a good high level of a lot of things that are happening. Unfortunately, we can't cover everything. We'd love to. But let me give you kind of the picture. Next slide, please. Uh, we have learned that uh, grassroots competition in cybersecurity is pretty much the killer the killer app for learning. And someone's got a little beep thing going in the background. I don't know who the heck that is. But anyhow, um, I've, I've seen a lot of uh, student competitions, you know, robotics and maker and this, that, and the other. And I've just always been surprised at the, at the level of engagement and, and the on the spot thinking and decision making that has to occur, the teamwork development uh, that happens uh, with these kind of cyber competition activities. And it's just, it's a goosebump experience to see it happen. And the students love it. And when you start thinking, how do you nurture a pipeline uh, for, of students in STEM from middle school to high school, community college and beyond, it's, it's, it's something really bears looking at. And we've been doing that for the last few years. So quickly on the left-hand side for uh, K through, our last three years have been focusing on K through 12 building a funnel of students, supporting the cultivation of the Cyber Patriot team. We didn't invent anything here. We just said, this is a good deal. Let's pour some money on it and help out any way we can. And the, the statewide competitions that are happening at SLO, we, we help support that. Uh, last year, a major intervention uh, with uh, funding from Strong Workforce Money helped create the California Mayor's Cyber Cup. And it's now offered by Cyber Guild. And uh, the culmination of that was we had 205 teams last year spring at 14 different community college locations with two teams from each region qualifying to go to uh, the uh, Cyber Challenge at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And I know the Cyber Hub has a, a goal of a thousand new teams for the next competition year. So that is going pretty well. It's a sustainable uh, model. We're happy to see that happen. And now we're shifting our focus a little bit more to the community college student. And today, we're going to hear a little bit from National Cyber League on, on how their, their platform can support that, especially if you're new in the business and you just want to get something going. Uh, and that uh, effort would also culminate in the uh, uh, Cyber Challenge at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. But it's important that we recognize that there are other platforms out there that are very innovative. I, we, last week, we heard from uh, Urban Lemus uh, regarding the Bay Cyber.net program and you know you, you'd really have to look at all the offerings to understand what's best for your campus some people like a more hands-on approach some people like to just say how much subscription for a student and, and let's make it easy but any whatever you do is going to take some involvement i think that's what we're going to hear about today is how to really make these things work i do want to add plug one, one last idea for the future is we've looked at k through 12 we looked at uh, california community colleges this year and we're going to well other people have been doing it once again we figure out what's going on and we try to help it grow. That's our, our role. We don't necessarily invent. And then, but 
wouldn't it be something if we get these kind of competitions going in the adult world with uh, between industry and government agencies and this, that, and the other? We have a huge challenge getting people who are out there functioning, maybe in a union role or whatever, motivated to learn new stuff if they don't have to. But a, a competition just might be the kind of thing that gets them going. So once again, grassroots competition is the killer app, and these are great templates for it. Having said that, uh, now I'm going to turn it over to uh, 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 Marcus and Wendy and Suzanne are going to tell us a little bit about our efforts over uh, their efforts over the last three years in terms of uh, the cyber competitions and the Mayor's Cup. Go ahead. All right. Um, well, my name is Dr. Marcus Geisler. I am a regional director for industry engagement for ICT and digital media. And today with my colleagues, Suzanne and Wendy will be talking about um, how to find good activities for your community college. So um, I'll let uh, <laughs> Wendy and then Suzanne introduce themselves and then uh, take it from there. Hi, Wendy Porter. <laughs> Hi, good morning. I'm Suzanne Mata. I'm from the Inland Empire Desert Region. So um, this is Suzanne. I think I am um, have the first few slides. So I want to just give you kind of a quick overview that if you decide at your campus uh, that you would like to host a, a cyber camp uh, or a summer camp, that you want to be sure to include some key details. And I reached out to quite a few people that have done camps uh, at their community colleges, and I asked for a lot of information. What, what are your recommendations? And first and foremost, I think I heard most often was that you can't do it alone. Um, so you need to have a team of people around you. And some of the key areas that you wanna be sure to have somebody helping you to cover are, are on the slide here. So you'll see, you wanna include something about your logistics. So you have to find an ideal location. Uh, make sure that you have necessary space and equipment. If you're doing obviously something with IT and cybersecurity, you need to have computers. So ideally a computer lab would be good. Um, something that I didn't put under logistics, but I should have um, would be your IT support. Um, so you wanna make sure that you have somebody that's involved in IT at the location. Uh, I recommend a community college. Uh, all the people that I talk to tend to host their camps on a community college campus. So with that, you get a lot of resources that are right there on campus. And you wanna make sure to pull that IT department in as soon as possible so that they can help. Um, if you're having to download virtual images and things like that, you wanna make sure that they're um, involved with that from the beginning so that they're just not those last minute hiccups. You're gonna want somebody that's gonna help you to promote your event because if you're having the event and you do all the planning, you wanna make sure that you fill it to capacity. So you need someone helping with marketing and um, getting the word out as far as uh, what your camp is, who the age range, et cetera. Uh, sponsorships would be a key area. If you don't have grant funds uh, to support your camp, then you wanna make sure that you're trying to connect with businesses and, and get some um, sponsorships that maybe can help with the food costs. Um, you need to have an overall administrator and have somebody that's managing things from your registrations uh, to your camp fees, your forms, and all of those necessary details. You need to have somebody that's uh, good with the paperwork and, and good with people. And of course, then a program manager, and they're going to help manage the camp content and coordinate presenters. Um, in my um, experience in reaching out to folks, that tends to be a faculty person, um, maybe from IT or CIS, um, at the community college. And they're passionate about bringing uh, the uh, information to the high school and middle school students. So that's somebody that um, could be on your team. Next slide. Um, something that you want to be sure to keep in mind would be that you're starting early. Uh, it's never too early to plan. Um, uh, my dean from Marina Valley College in my local area said she was already planning next year's camp before this camp um, from this past summer was over. 
Um, so another uh, key area that you want to be sure to focus on would be your target audience. You're going to have to consider some different things from your age and grade level to the skill level of the students that you're targeting. Of course, your younger students are not going to be as advanced. Um, so you want to um, play with this. This is the information that I received from a few people is that um, one year they went down to fifth grade and figured out quickly that those students were too young and it didn't necessarily mesh with the rest of the older students. So they determined that 6th through 12th grade was probably the best range, but that may be different in your area. So you would just want to explore that and figure out what works. Um, and then from there, once you figure out your age range, then you're going to have to determine your number of participants. And of course, then that's going to dictate where do you host it um, and other key logistics. So uh, you just have to plan every detail and make sure that you have all of those key things covered. Um, some sample budget items, you are going to have to consider that you can't do the camp, um, you know, at no cost. So um, some of the key areas to think about that are going to uh, cost some money would be um, your venue, unless you hold it, usually the community colleges will, will offer the space for no charge. Uh, the main cost that you would have at the community college would be the catering, um, on-campus catering, um, but otherwise the facility would be free. Um, food, of course, you're going to want to have lots of snacks, and um, I heard that from quite a few people when I reached out. Uh, make sure that you have uh, a lot of snacks and a lot of drinks because that's uh, motivating and um, helpful with the students. Um, T-shirts and prizes if you're going to do that and have, you know, maybe a logo and those different things, so you'll want to factor that in. Of course, you're printing in your handouts, uh, photographer if you want to catch the, the event, maybe a videographer if you wanted to get a video, um, and I already mentioned catering. So next slide. So determining your specific camp details is going to be important up front. Um, I did have most people prefer, um, in my experience, to do the face-to-face -face camp. You have a more intimate setting and opportunity to get to know students. And of course, um, for us, if we're talking about building and aligning pathways, we want to feed from our high schools into our community college. So hosting a camp or an activity on our community college campus is a great way to have those uh, students see your campus and, and see what the college looks like get a little bit familiar so it takes some of those scary things out um, so that's always a, a good reason to do a face-to-face -face, but if you wanted to try it out there is opportunities to do some online camps um, and there is a lot of information out there so if that's something that you would be interested you could consider that and I already mentioned kind of uh, depending on your age um, of your students that you're targeting you may have two levels of learning at your camp and you could probably combine those but you would have beginning and maybe intermediate and then more advanced um, content so you want to make sure that depending on that um, who's coming and who are SVPs that you target those specific skill levels so that you're not doing something that's out of their um, ability because then that wouldn't be a fun camp. Um, so then you're also setting your camp date, your duration. Um, in our region we typically do um, a week long, it's usually four full days. Um, at I was uh, told that the best time to do it is right at the end of that school year, early in the summer. If you wait too long, you tend to lose people and you won't get the interest um, and necessarily fill your camp. Um, Cyber Patriot does offer a schedule as a guide, so you can look up Cyber Patriot and you could do your camp in conjunction um, with what they do. And then, of course, you're going to want to plan your uh, agenda for the day, um, starting time, end time, when you're going to do lunch and have food. So you want to make sure that you plan all those logistics ahead of time and that you have enough uh, staff and volunteers to help you manage that time schedule. And then, of course, you're uh, choosing your venue, venue then based on the duration and the availability of that venue. So next slide. Uh, you might want to consider goals. I mentioned um, building pathways between our high schools. We're trying to build a pipeline of students. Uh, camps and summer activities are a great way to uh, peak interest, uh, to show off our campuses and get students interested. Um, you could also consider things like metrics, would, uh, which you would see here, such as increasing enrollment at our community colleges, uh, growing the number of students taking cybersecurity or IT courses, um, building up that pipeline, um, creating interest in cybersecurity and IT, um, and strengthening cybersecurity skills. So those are all key things that you could be thinking about, and then you want to make sure that your activities and your content are kind of um, consistent with what those goals might be. Next slide. 
So I'll go through these really quick. The next two slides are just some tips. So I, I mentioned that I reached out to a lot of people and these were just some of the key things that they shared. Uh, you aren't, you're gonna wanna find a champion. Um, I mentioned already a faculty person at the community college uh, could be that uh, champion. We have a great one at Marina Valley College and they host camps every summer. And she is the person who plans the content. She does great things and uh, does awards and medals. So you want somebody that's very passionate about what they're doing. Um, and if you can, if you can also get a champion from your high school and your middle school, if you're going to be reaching out to those two age groups. Uh, start small the first time you do it, figure out what works, and then build upon that in the future. So you can start small, maybe do a small group of kids, and then it, what, you know, based on what works, then you can build it from there. Um, have solid takeaway lessons for your students or problems for them to solve so that they feel like they're active participants um, and they get some hands-on um, experience at the same time. And of course, fun, engaging um, things are excellent. Next slide. And this will be my last. Uh, communication is key. I mentioned your team. You're going to want to keep those uh, folks all um, communicating with one another and communicating to the people at your high schools, whoever you're marketing to. Um, identifying potential funding is always good. We have a lot of things going on right now that could help, including strong workforce uh, program at the community colleges or the K-12 strong workforce. Perkins, of course, is a great opportunity. Um, and then collecting your feedback. This was something I heard multiple times. At the end of the camp, you're gonna wanna survey and you're wanna, gonna uh, collect information based on um, the experience of the students, the parents, um, the high schools, and just uh, figure out what went well, what didn't work necessarily, and then um, use that to make your camp even better the next year. So that's all I have. Su Suzanne, could you uh, let us know how many um participants you had, how many teams you had in the, in the Inland Empire based on these efforts? Um, so I, I don't have the specific numbers on the students. I have three colleges that are very active in doing camps, Riverside City College and then Marina Valley College. Um, I know we, we started small at Marina Valley and they maybe had um, about 50 students that first year and they've grown, I think they've more than doubled their camps. Uh, Marina Valley College also um, has expanded and they include new coaches training or mentoring as part of theirs. So while the kids are doing camp, the, the new coaches and teachers at our high schools um, that plan to start Cyber Patriot are doing training at the same time. So um, Steve, I'm sorry, I don't have the specific numbers on the camps, but I do have, we have 12 colleges in our two county region and uh, three of them are active camp um, hosts during the summer. It's a great program. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think Wendy's next. Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Porter. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, I'm the regional director for ICT in the far north, representing uh, seven community colleges. And I wanted to share with you a little bit of a, a story about what happened with us in the far north for uh, participating in the mayor's cyber cup last year. Uh, so this has really been a way to drive the importance of tech tech education within our community to not just our education partners, but to our, our government and the community in general, parents especially. Uh, so that's a picture of um, us outside of the City Hall building with the winning team from the Mayor's Cup. And I'm gonna share some more pictures with you before I go into some details. So here are some other pictures during the competition. And the, the people in the green t-shirts are the mentors or the coaches. And I wanted to point out on the upper left-hand corner, that is Linda Fisher, a Butte College uh, IT professor, talking with our assistant city manager. And that's an example of the kind of engagement that's happening during this competition. On the right um, upper corner, you can see our mayor, our Chico mayor, interacting with the students during the competition. So it really, it was amazing. This event was really powerful to bring these kinds of um, relationships together. Next slide. Once again, so this is during the competition, uh, the kids were having a blast, and I wanted to point out that there are close to 37,000 jobs right now open in cybersecurity. So this event was really a good way for us to show the parents and the students the opportunity to get into a high paying career. And we have a lot of good uh, marketing materials to, uh, to help drive that. I, I wanted to mention that when we started um, last fall, out of our seven community colleges and in the surrounding areas, we had one cyber team at one of the high schools. 
So I was a little hesitant in getting involved in this, but um, Suzanne and others, you know, encouraged us and the people at Cyber Guild and Synad were really, really great with the materials they provided. And we were able to go in with this marketing materials to the high schools and get them excited and wanting to participate. So we ended up having 18 teams between um, Mendocino County and Butte County participating in this competition. So the, the pictures you're seeing here are from Butte College. Mendocino College was also participating and we were connected through a Zoom conference. So it was really great. And it was, it was neat because all of the teams were brand new. So we were at beginner level. So they were competing at the same level together. And that's, I kind of think the power of this um, Mayor's Pep Challenge. Next slide, Marcus. So that's the, the famous balloon arch. I mean, I was a little hesitant in trying to put, put that together, but it was suggested by the people at, uh, at Cyber Guild and Synod, and it was, it was fantastic. So this was the end of the competition. Each team identified a theme song, and we had a DJ, and they ran through the balloon arch to their theme song, and it was, it was just really cool. So the other, so at the bottom left-hand corner, that's the mayor, and that's the um, trophy that he won since Chico's high school team was the winning team. Uh, Ukiah High School actually got second place, and so both of those teams were able to go down to San Luis Obispo and participate in the statewide competition. Uh, what I want to point out that's really important here on the bottom right, those are our industry partners. So those are CTOs, um, IT directors, and CEOs of the local businesses that have cybersecurity jobs, and so they were able to engage with the students and talk about the actual types of jobs that are available in their local community and kind of generate that interest in going into those careers. Next slide. So really for us, it was um, by far, it was the relationships that were built between the education partners and the government and just the community in general. So what we were able to do, we had, uh, Chico State professors and Chico State students helping mentor the high school teams as well as the community college students mentoring the high school teams. So it created, I know that there are two new articulation classes going in with Butte College because of this event and another transfer program going from Butte College into Chico State. And there's, um, there's activity in Mendocino and discussions happening in Mendocino. So by participating in this uh, in this event, those relationships were developed. And so those people are continuing to talk with each other, the high school faculty, the community college faculty, and the state university faculty. And it's been, it's been wildly successful for us. And as far as, um, that's a picture of us inside of the um, city council meeting. So we did go to the city council meeting and present the award to the mayor. The students were blown away. So these are kids that don't, typically participate in sports. And a lot of the parents uh, came up to me afterwards and said, you know, they, their kids had never had a, a, ch a chance to win something. So sorry, I'm getting emotional. It was pretty, it was pretty powerful. So the st student success there was, was really good and it, it gave them such an empowerment. Um, and I wanted to point out also that our industry partners, one of the most important skill sets that they talk about is, uh, is being able to work in a team. So this competition-based learning is, is huge for that. And they were able to see, walk around, our, our industry partners walk around during this competition and um, watch how these students are interacting. Go ahead to the next slide, Marcus. So there's a lot of information on this slide. Um, I just wanted to point out to all of you, our story up here is this is brand new for us. We participated in the, in the challenge uh, last year, and now that has engaged more high school faculty to start cyber teams. So it really doesn't matter where you are in um, the yearly cycle, you can get started anytime. Uh, at the beginning of the fall semester and at the beginning of the spring semester, that's the time to get the faculty engaged in creating cyber teams at the high schools. And um, there are a lot of different competitions that you can participate in, Cyber Patriots, National Cyber League, uh, and you can work with your uh, regional directors for industry engagement. So that's myself and Marcus and Suzanne, whoever is your representative in your area, to help get you the materials you need to get the team started to um, get them signed into Cyber, Cyber Guild. Um, and now more and more um, in the Bay Area, even in Sacramento, and all, there are other programs popping up, other competitions popping up. So like I said, it doesn't really matter when you get started. The summer camps are, are critical for driving the pipeline as well. So it get, keeps the students engaged. It keeps the motivation flowing. 
Um, and like Suzanne said, it's so important to find those faculty champions. So getting the high school teachers and the co community college faculty members engaged with each other to drive these activities will we'll keep it moving forward. So, oh, and I, I guess the last thing I wanted to bring up is the what we've seen now is the high school students that were seniors that are now going to the community college, they are interested in becoming mentors for high school teams. And it works that way at the, at the university level too. So it does create this, this circle of um, students empowering each other for these important skills. So thank you. Thank you, Wendy, very inspirational. Uh, Marcus. All right, with the minute I have left, I'll, I'll finish up real quick. Um, we've talked about Cyber Patriot. Uh, the one thing I'll point out, three divisions that uh, have ability to have you have kids, not just from schools, but also from other community organizations, such as scouting units, et cetera. So um, if you are working in the community, um, again, of course, K-12 partners would be great, but they're not the only ones. How do you build a team? Um, you may well find a Cyber Patriot Center of Excellence in your area that will help you with this. And again, if you're a college professor and you don't want to do this all yourself, um, work with other folks. Uh, don't spend a whole lot of time hopefully raising funds for the team fees. Talk to your regional director to see if there's any funds available or talk to your deans about uh, some CTE funds. Um, invite industry partners to serve as technical mentors. A great way to tie things together. And if you want to do Cyber Patriot this year, your deadline will be October 2nd. There are other competitions. Cyber Patriot is great. I mean, that's what I'm using primarily in my region here in Greater Sacramento. But uh, there's Pico CTF, and the Bay Area has developed uh, a CC Purple Team competition, and there's National Cyber League that will be covered here in just a little while. Um, but keep in mind, registration ends on October 11th and October 10th. It's not too late to get started. And I've given you these links, and yes, these slides will be made available after the presentation. There is the uh, top competition as well, which is the National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. That's during the spring, so yes, you can do this uh, year round. So if you don't wanna get started or can't get started by the time October rolls around, you can certainly do this in, in the spring as well. Even National Cyber League has options available there that they'll talk about. And uh, as was mentioned by my colleagues, yes, we're trying to feed from the middle school, high school into the colleges. Hire those community college faculty as your instructors for your cyber camps. Try to get them to be your coaches for your teams, um, even at the high school level, and frankly, have them collaborate with uh, high school faculty as uh, IAs uh, for those cyber camps to help build that pipeline. And then, as was mentioned, leverage some other available resources. Perkins, uh, K-12, and I'll end with a great activity that's happened here in my region where I was actually able to pass on the organization of those cyber camps from me as the regional director, together with my faculty champions, onto a uh, case 12 strong workforce grant called the ICT Hub, and that will do it from here on out for me so that I don't have to remain involved. So I served as a spark as a regional director or as a faculty member, and then from here on out, um, it was somebody else taking over. All right, that covers my time. Thank you very much. I'll pass it back to Steve. Well, thank you, Marcus and, and Wendy and Suzanne. I, I, you know, we have, I, I think, about 10 or 11 uh, regional directors who have all embraced this uh, competition with the high schools very much. It's, it's one of the most passionate things that they enjoy doing. And, uh, and, and you can see why. Uh, the feedback from the students and their engagement is, is, is incredible. And, and now that we understand that piece, as I said, the next step is to figure out a little bit better about the community college student uh, competitions and see if we can uh, get, promote some more of those. And uh, we mentioned the Baynet uh, one last week, and I think there's some others out there. Today, we're gonna take a little bit of time and, and look at the uh, National Cyber League, and we have Dan Manson and Franz uh, payer on, on the line to go through their slides on how that works. So uh, without any further discussion, why don't we shift to that piece. Hi, everyone. Um, I've been involved with National Cyber League since it started in 2012. It's one of the best collaborations I've ever had the privilege to be part of. 
Um, we had simple goals in, at the beginning, which I think really helped. We were all veterans of uh, the National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. And CCDC is a great competition. It's still going well, but there are frustrations we all had. One is that you could only have one team per school. Another is that if you lost in one of the early rounds, you were out of the competition. We wanted something that was much more inclusive, that would um, target community colleges, and we wanted everyone to have a chance to play an entire season. We also wanted to give you metrics. We wanted to give you a chance to see how you performed compared to others. We also wanted to be able to put you in um, brackets where if you were beginning, you were playing with other beginners. If you were more advanced, you could have a chance to compare yourself with other advanced players. And so NCL is a community. It's where cybersecurity unites other like-minded high school and college students and ignites a passion for their courses and careers. It's where players connect to learn, play, and achieve. It's an all-inclusive virtual hub that creates relationship through learning the necessary cybersecurity skills via social media puzzles, live online conversations, and training events. And our signature statement, it's where cybersecurity is a passion. It's a biannual competition powered by Cyber Skyline. Franz is uh, the co-founder of Cyber Skyline. And it's been a wonderful relationship to work with Cyber Skyline over the past few years to really grow Cyber Patriot, uh, National Cyber League. So I'm gonna let Franz dig into what NCL is now. We really encourage your questions and I just want to mention that California leads the nation with over 1,100 NCL players. 20% of the players in National Cyber League are in California. Franz? Thank you, Dan, for that introduction. Um, I'll, right now, what we have on the screen is kind of some screenshots of what you can see from NCL. Um, Dan was mentioning the data. On the right side, we have a screenshot of the analytics that you can get out of NCL. This is just one component of that, but something that students have been able to find very useful is um, being able to track their growth and skills development through NCL. So we have all sorts of comparative metrics. There's a timeline showing how you compare to um, different percentiles of the population we have a little uh, bubble chart scatter plot there uh, we also have a histogram of, of point distribution and you can segment this in many different ways so you can look at specific skill sets so this is kind of like an overall look at someone's report but you could go and segment and look at maybe I only be want to look at my performance for cryptography or web application security or um, log analysis and you can actually get different metrics from all of those different segments. Um, there's also the metrics from this in the overall performance of all students who participate in NCL. But um, as I mentioned before, we bracket students into um, appropriate skill level groups so that you can compare yourself to other beginners or un other intermediate students or other advanced students. So not only do you get your overall performance, but you also get your performance within that skill bracket. Um, and on the left side is, kind of a screenshot of what the platform looks like. Basically what we've done is we've set up real world virtual scenarios and it can be something, in this case we have um, a wireless network where the student has to go in and break into the wireless network conduct some sort of audit and then answer questions, you know, like what's the wireless password, um, you know, what security mechanisms were in place, once they break into the wireless network, what information could they find on that network, stuff like that. So they're meant to be very real world solutions. And the idea is that after they perform all these tasks, they get all this data, they can then, you know, use that to inform their skills development, but they can also use that information and provide that, that to employers uh, when they're going to interviews for internships or jobs. So here are a couple of reasons why you should participate in NCL. I kind of broke it down for, for students and for schools. Um, from a high level, I already mentioned some of this, but being able to understand strengths and weaknesses is very important. That hands-on experience is something that employers are really interested in. And it's an enjoyable thing that our students come back, at, you know, season after season. We look at the, uh, the surveys. We have 96% of all respondents saying that they found NCL to be, a, you know, at least a positive experience for them. Um, 
so there's great feedback on that side and on the school side you know you're supplementing your classroom learning we have a lot of uh, professors who will use NCL as an exercise in conjunction with their class uh, you know the class material so that students get this extra experience and extra hands-on practice uh, additionally if uh, you're a CAE school or you're looking to get your CAE um, you know certification you you need to participate in cyber competitions to meet those requirements. So NCL could be a way to go and do that. Uh, additionally, we started um, coming out with the cyber power rankings, which are ranking the top schools in the US based off of their performance in NCL. And it's a really good way for uh, everyone to see, you know, where the, the top schools are and who's bringing the talent. I'll, I'll go over the high level of what is an NCL season. So there's four main components to the season. There's the gymnasium. Uh, the gymnasium is basically a practice environment where students will be able to look at past challenges. There's guys, there's answers uh, to help them learn as they go through the NCL season. Um, that's available through the entire duration of the season. It's even available during the actual game. So if students are stuck during the middle of the game, they can actually go back to the gymnasium and look at that sample and use that as a guide to help them when they compete. Um, we also have the preseason, which is the first kind of, uh, you know, more timed event that happens during the season. That's a, a full week where students get to go in. Um, we use previous uh, seasons content for that and students get to go through go through the challenges and based off their performance they get bracketed. So this is not meant for, um, you know, necessarily saying who's best. It's meant to just, you know, separate out the different skill levels so that in the individual game, um, you're going to be compared against appropriate people. The individual game is a week-long event. I believe the the, the first um, it's the first weekend event, the first competitive event, really, and that happens um, the first week of November, weekend of November. And students are going to be competing by themselves, and they're going to be trying to solve as many challenges as possible. They're going to have the leaderboards, like I mentioned, and that's kind of where they're really competing and showing off their skills. Um, two weeks later, we have the team game. That's another weekend-long competition. Teams are formed of up to seven people. Uh, again, the same exact same um, format as the individual game, except now you have the ability to work with your peers. And it's a really interesting experience because all of the progress is synced across the user. So if they get access to their terminal environment, everything that um, one team member types it can be seen by the other team members. So they don't have to be in person. They can compete remotely and still collaborate. Um, and again, we have separate leaderboards for um, different brackets, skill brackets. Um, after, so also I, uh, while, while I'm presenting, I can't see any of the chat. So if there's any questions that I should, uh, answer immediately, uh, someone please let me know so I can, uh, answer those. I will but, let you know. Okay. Thank you. Um, after all of the, you know, different parts of the season, you get your scouting report, which is kind of, you know, the big take, take home, um, that students get from participating. This is an example of one, but, um, the idea is that we've broken down your performance, uh, into the specific different, uh, the, the skill sets, and then you're going to get a national rank. You're going to get your, your bracket rank, um, the score, the flag captures accuracy. There's a preamble at the beginning of this that kind of explains what the NCL is and how it works for employers. Um, you also have your overall performance at the top as well. But the idea being that this is something that they can take back with them, the students can take back with them and um, use for their reference. They can bring this to employers and show off their skills. Um, a big benefit to NCL that we don't see in a lot of other competitions is the fact that you can track your performance across different seasons. So um, you, once you participate in NCL, when you come back again the next year, the next semester, all of your past history is still there. So you can go back and look at how you performed in each individual skill set, uh, you know, both your individual performance and your comparative performance. And you can use that to, to benchmark your own growth and say, hey, you know, maybe I really need to practice my log analysis because you can see my, my ranking there is not so good, but cryptography is, is doing pretty well. Um, and that level of insight and that ability to track growth has been very um, incentivizing, motivating for students to continue, um, you know, even if, because we always get this question, you know, what happens if they don't perform very well? Um, 
you could probably ask that question to our um, chief player ambassador, Caitlin, but she started off at the bottom of the pack, but we've given her the information, that data, and as she kind of progressed through her career, uh, her career as a student, and she came back for NCL season after season, she could see that growth, and even though she didn't do well that first season, being able to see that growth has been a huge motiva motivating thing. Who plays in NCL? It's a national reach. We've got um, students in every state, even uh, Puerto Rico, but it's pretty inclusive. So we have high school students, community colleges, universities. There's no restriction on the number of students you can have participate, no restriction on the number of teams. Um, so we get, you know, people from a huge diversity of backgrounds. Um, I have the, the top five winners from the spring season. So we had uh, University of Nevada, Reno, uh, University of Hawaii, uh, Manoa, uh, Chico, Folsom Lake College, that's community college in California, and NYU. So we've got, you know, really big brand name, you know, fancy universities like NYU, but also the community colleges are able to um, demonstrate their skills and show off if, uh, if you have talented students. And I think that's kind of one of the big, um, you know, differentiators uh, with NCL is that we don't always see the same schools uh, taking the top of the leaderboard every single year. Um, people... Well, let, me, let me jump in right now. We're starting to get questions. Okay. So one question is, what is the cost for teams? What is the size of the teams? The price you pay to play NCL is a season price. It's uh, $35 for everything from um, preseason to gym access, to individual game, postseason game scouting report. What is the size of the teams for uh, postseason front? The size of the teams is two to seven players. Um, we, we really believe that the, 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 the team component is a huge motivating factor um, and to help incentivize actually the participation of teams in the team season, we've actually started a promotion. We're actually going to be sending out stickers to uh, teams of three or more players. So the team component is a huge thing. I, I don't want people to just do NCL for the individual component. Um, so uh, it's important to get teams involved in NCL. So there are a few questions on costs. Um, and there's a school that I think is doing something innovative. We're always looking for ways to assist schools in, in supporting NCL and supporting their players. So Skip Berry from RCC said that they're uh, doing an annual purchasing pilot for budgeting fees. Um, question from Richard Grodegut, is there a high school level? It's the same price for college and high schools and the eligibility is any high school student can play. Um, then Tara wanted to know if there's a middle school division. No, not at this time. Um, ninth grade on is, is where we um, encourage students to play in CL. Uh, there is one, uh, a different competition, it's a really good one, which does encourage middle school students to play, and that's PICO CTF. So we also encourage you to play in other similar competitions to build your skills. And, if you have middle school students, I would encourage them to try PICO CTF. Uh, Debbie wants to know, how do I become an NCL coach, which is a great question. Franz, can you talk about the, how the coach signs up and how the, the, the coach actually plays for free? So Franz will explain the coach. Sure, I'll actually skip ahead to the, <laughs> to the slide here um, with this information. So, um, Coach registration is completely free, just like Dan mentioned. Um, to be a coach, all you need to do is go to the same registration link uh, that I have on the screen, and uh, a copy of these slides will be made available after the presentation. But um, when you go to the registration page, there will be a button for individual registration as a student, or you can register as a coach. Now, as a coach, um, you you know you could facilitate a lot of the um the organization with with your students for ncl so coaches have the ability to get a dashboard of their students so if you have your students register individually when you register you'll get like a pairing link that you can go and give your students and then once they confirm that link um you'll be able to see them in your dashboard you can see all of their performance in real time and you'll get access to the same content that they have access to uh you also have the ability to make a purchase to pay for your students registration if you do that whether if that's going through a purchase order process or whether you uh, you can make a credit card purchase um, we'll actually code your information into those codes so that when your students redeem those codes they'll automatically be paired with you so 
the idea being that if you're a coach, you can monitor all of your students, you can get access to all of the content, you can provide that mentorship without any overhead and any hassle. I think it's great that you're flexible on that. I think uh, we'll probably be exploring packages that are fundable uh, that could help us uh, get this going. Thank you. Right. I'll, I'll go back now. I think you got a little bit of a teaser, but um, <laughs> I wanted to highlight that 66, 66%, two thirds of all CAE schools uh, participate in NCL. And that's just a, a, an indicator of how useful NCL is in all these different cybersecurity programs. And uh, I have some links up here, which will be available um, from the slides. I can go look through them quickly, but we have information on, um, we have this uh, heat map of different schools and where all the students are coming from, from NCL. You can um, go down to each state, you can drill down. Here's what it looks like for California. We have a huge participation from, uh, from Chico. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the Bay Area as well. Um, but you can go and look th at this and, and click around. We also have our um, list of colleges. So these are all the, the colleges, all the schools that participate in NCL, and it's broken down by state. So we can see all the California schools here. Um, this link's in the slides. And uh, we have our power rankings as well. So this, we just started the season, um, this past season. And you can see, uh, you can go back actually to the fall. You can look at national rankings. You can look at the Eastern Conference. You can look at the Western Conference. Uh, we're going to be adding another one there for CAE schools. And we're going to be adding more and more different breakdowns as well. But this is a great opportunity for your students to compete and really represent your school and, and you know, put yourself on the leaderboard here. Uh, and this is not just looking at any one component of NCL, this is looking at the aggregate performance within NCL. So we're looking at your top team's performance. We're looking at your top um, individual player's performance, but we're also looking at the aggregate performance of all of the players that you have from your school. And so we use these three different factors to determine your overall cyber power ranking. And um, it allows both large and small schools to kind of demonstrate themselves here. Um, you know, Folsom Lake College, uh, uh, they don't have very many students participate, but because they were able to do very well in the team, uh, the team game, you know, they did, they scored very high on the leaderboard. So um, this is something that we're, we're making it uh, a representation of the school's overall performance. And it's not just going to be the school that, you know, funnels through the most students in NCL. It's going to be the top. It's going to be the ones that are producing the highest quality students. Okay, uh, jumping to the uh, participation in NCL. So right now we uh, don't have the spring 2019 numbers, but we, we surpassed 5,000 in spring as well. So now we're seeing over 10,000 students a year participating in NCL. It's been growing very rapidly and now is really the time to, to join in, get your name on that leaderboard as well. And finally, we're at the uh, how do you participate? So um, as Dan mentioned, it's $35 per student. Um, high school and college is the same price. That's including everything, the gym, the preseason, the individual game, the team game, everything, $35. Coach registration is free. Uh, registration is open now until October 10th. I think after October 10th, we have a couple of days of late registration for an additional $10 more. So it's $45 if you register late. Um, so make sure that you register now <laughs> and, and get there on time. And if you have any questions at all, um, you know, we're very reachable. So uh, any support questions, you can reach us at contact at cyberskyline.com. There's more information on the National Cyber League website. And um, NCL is really a great way for anyone in cybersecurity, whether you're a high school, uh, for your university, community college, to really go and practice your skills and apply those skills. And I think these quotes that we have up here kind of demonstrate that, um, where it's really been an inspiration to a lot of um, students and a lot and it helps them value some of the education they're getting in class. If they can actually demonstrate those skills in a, a real world scenario that they can understand, they feel like they're getting more from that class. So um, it's been a huge value add. And uh, with that, I'll open up for any additional questions. Well, and, and I want to very quickly, thank you, Franz. That was a, a wonderful introduction to the platform, the services, and the capabilities. And we're going to open it up to uh, further questions in a minute. But I, first, I want to uh, point out that whether it's the, uh, the Cyber Patriots or the Cyber Guild uh, Maris Cup or, or this uh, uh, NCL activities, I, I believe they're all funneling into the uh, statewide Cyber Innovation Challenge at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. 
And uh, Paula Hodge is on the line and she uh, has been participating as a judge and managing that in her region for some time. Uh, Paula, could you make a comment or two about uh, how that's happening? Yes. Um, so we've been listening in and Henry Danielson, who's the project manager for the CCI is here with us and he can explain and, and dive more into what is occurring um, for a statewide uh, competition. Well, thank you very much. And Henry, be, just before you start, I just want to say that the, the, uh, the uh, Cyber Innovation Challenge is, is becoming one of the headliners that the government, the legislature, everybody looks at as some sort of measure of, of whether we're being proactive in cybersecurity in our educational institutions uh, statewide. So it's a proxy for that. I'm sure there are many other uh, valuable competitions around uh, the nation and the world, but uh, you seem to have uh, garnered uh, a lot of attention. So uh, how are you going to make it work and continue it? So that, that's a great question, and uh, I, I applaud everyone's efforts in our room and on the call, and thank you for uh, hosting this today. I think it's a real, uh, I don't know, a powerful tool that we're uh, able to do. This is the fourth year. On your, to answer your question, um, the state um, has, has been challenging to get funding, and um, I think that what we're doing this year is we're um, using a lot of private funding and other means to be able to um, garner that, uh, that issue. And I don't know, for the fourth year in a row, we'll be hosting it at Cal Poly. And what's really been unique is last year we had over 150 students coming um, from Paradise, California, all the way up to uh, San Diego. So we had over 21 schools participate. And the cool part about this is they actually stay on campus at Cal Poly uh, in the dorms. Uh, it has been free. We have not charged any of the students. The hard part is getting people to come from their areas or their regions to be able to participate in this. And this year, I'm really proud to say, and you have the great slide up there, thank you for sharing that, the convergence of space and cybersecurity. And this year, we are going to be um, talking about and learning how to, I'll just say it out loud, hack satellites. And we are going to be touching that space because the current infrastructure of satellites in our uh, area is needs to be addressed. So we're trying to fill that gap because we know that students um, are the front lines of some of this learning. So what's also amazing about our, uh, our event is we put on in a live immersive environment that represents a real, uh, real world scenario. And what's going to happen this year is a satellite without revealing all of it is going to be crashed to earth and the students are going to be uh, plunged into this story and trying to figure out uh, what actually happened to that satellite and how uh, it, it did some damage to other parts of the other satellites. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, to stress is that we're going to be working with uh, the South um, Central um, Coast, region. Coach, Coast Region, <laughs> our personal region, and we're looking at other community colleges to help support the design of the challenge, as well as the design of the actual satellite um, hitting the ground. And we're gonna be calling it a payload, is what it's technically called. So I'm really excited to be able to share with you that that's gonna be happening on June 27th and 28th. Um, we're also working on getting a cyber camp uh, the week before to be able to train students um, that may not be able to get the training or may not have a school that's actually has a cyber team. And then we'll also be having a cyber symposium this year, um, space symposium with NASA and all the other uh, relevant participants uh, in the space program, as well as Vandenberg and um, also Edwards Air Force Base. We're working to work with the Antelope Valley as well. So I'm to answer your question again, back to that, uh, the state, uh, we do take them, all of the participants go to the Capitol and actually get to talk to the legislative uh, folks and um, the senators and they were given awards and they go every year. That's part of what we do is we take the winners up there to or over there to Sacramento to be able to um, resonate with the state legislator, the how, how legislature, how, how powerful this is. And again, we're, we're very power, uh, very uh, impressed with 
uh, NCL, I've been working with them um, to try to get other people involved, um, as well as the Cyber Patriot teams, and making sure that our young people are in this space. So I know I rambled a lot, but I wanted to give you the just gist of it. And, Does that answer? And Henry, um, maybe um, also add this year for the challenge, they're also having community college challenge, where before it was just middle school and high school. You wanna add a little bit on that? Yeah, um, I, I've been told that what they really wanna do, um, and I didn't tell you this yet, Paula, but okay, they, update. yeah, but <laughs> the, the update was we are still, this year gonna stick with our middle school as well as the um, high schools, and then uh, in the future, we'll be adding the community college. But I, I do want to say that I'm, I'm really trying to represent everyone in that space. And I know that the NCL um, is doing a wonderful job getting the community colleges. And I'm working with our region to try to get current community college teams up and running, working with the NCL and trying to get our own little mini competition within our own region, uh, a capture the flag, if you will. Um, so at this time, I think what's going to happen is we're still sticking with the, the middle school and the high school to speak with that. And Henry, is there an opportunity possibly for um, any of the community college students that are in cybersecurity to maybe be a mentor or yes, or we're participate yes, in some yes, way? yes. And I, I'm the project manager, so I'm going to be putting out, uh, and I'll, I'll get with Steve as well and the team, and be able to share with all of the regions what kind of things we'd love to have happen with the community colleges, the Bay Area, and everywhere else to make sure that. Um, we want mentors. We also want, uh, we're going to have judges again. We're going to have something this year uh, that we want to anticipate uh, a success as ambassadors, folks um, from the, the sectors as well as uh, industry to be able to work with the students as well as the parents and let them know what kind of things are happening uh, during that, the, the challenge itself. And I was a judge um, last year, and it, it is quite a... a uh, experience and and the knowledge that these students have it's just amazing and very impressive well I want to thank you Paula and, and Henry and, and the rest of you in the room uh, for participating and and sharing the information about uh, the SLO uh, innovation challenge I, I, I do hope that you can move toward uh, community college and, and uh, competitions as well uh, I, th I think that rounds out the uh, accessibility of this kind of thing for the state in terms of addressing a whole lot of populations where uh, this is a critical endeavor. So I look forward to that happening. And uh, right now, with just a few minutes left, I'm just gonna, well, actually one minute, but we can go a little bit longer. If anybody has any questions, um, ask them now. I know we've given you a heck of a lot of information. The beauty is this is recorded. It'll be posted chapterized and we'll have a complete transcript and all the uh, presentations will be included as, as well as any other materials that our speakers uh, share with us. So you'll be able to find the whole thing on our website and be able to review it. Plus we have additional uh, webinars coming up dealing with other aspects of cyber competition. So we are not done yet. Any other questions for today or any comments from the, uh, the group of, it looks like 25 plus 20 people, including the room where Paula and Henry are? Hey Steve, it's Sean. Yeah. Um, did we get an answer to the question about what um, marketing materials Wendy is using up there for her trips to the to the high schools? I know there was some interest in that. Yeah, so I think I saw a couple of those. A desire to see what kind of marketing materials are used. Uh, Wendy, is it possible to share that uh, and we can include it on our website? Definitely. Yeah, so I think most of those materials we got through um, CINED and the Cyber Guild. Um, but really, uh, to be honest, it was... It was about getting in front of the classroom, having a person be in front of the classroom and talk to the students and the teachers. Because I did pass around flyers and it, it was that that personal. So it's both. But yes, I'll get you the flyers. Okay. Well, hopefully we didn't inundate people with too much information today. But as you can see, there's a lot going on. And uh, we'll try to be a repository of knowledge and, and connections and time frames and that kind of thing for you. I want to thank everybody for uh, joining with us today and participating. And uh, we'll see you next week to talk about the uh, certification testing centers.